Hello. Hi, James. How hey, are you? How's it going? Yeah, sorry, I had a problem with the with the link, but I've got it now. Good, good. No worries that we are just arriving on time. So, if you have everything ready, do you have your presentation somewhere with you? Yeah, sorry, I had a bit of a feedback there, but I think it's um, resolved now. Um, let me. You should mute the the venue less. Yes, yes, I have less, done. I was, and... I had a, I had some problems there, but that seems to have been resolved. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Great. Yes, okay. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Yes. Very well. Good. So okay. we can see your video and we can see your presentation. So I'll ask you, James, to introduce yourself. So, and I will get out of the stage. So <laughs> have a nice presentation. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. This is uh, my talk testing geospatial JavaScript. Um, so ooh, got a bit carried away there. Um, so yeah, I'm James Milner. Uh, I'm the web development lead at uh, Dent Reality. We're an indoor um, AR like uh, navigation platform that kind of brings the online uh, benefits of online shopping to physical retail. And then kind of also more broadly, we're trying to um, become sort of like the digital layer for the physical world. And I'll show you a bit more what that looks like in the next few slides. Um, first thing to say on that is that we are uh, currently hiring so if anything that you, know, you see over the next few slides kind of piques your interest then please feel free to come chat to me afterwards um i'm also a maintainer of turf.js um that's kind of a recent thing um but i've kind of become involved with that so if you are we're always looking for people to kind of come and get involved and file issues and make pull requests and you know generally all that good open source stuff so if you're interested then Again, feel free to reach out to me or just go straight to Turf and, and just get stuck in. Um, and lastly, I'm also a Google developer expert for web technologies. Um, and so, yeah. And so if you want to tweet at me during this presentation, my handle is James L. Milner on Twitter as well. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you can see this uh, video. It's actually a GIF I, that I've had to convert because it's quite large. Um, but just want to give some context around uh, some of the stuff that we do here at Dent Reality and kind of what's kind of been some of the impetus for this talk and something I've been, you know, testing um, off the back of my work at Dent has been just something I've been thinking about a lot over the sort of like last year and a half. Um, so at Dent, we're trying to build this, uh, like I was saying, this digital layer to like the physical world. Um, and that means in practice is, is that we're building sort of innovative and helpful ways to guide through people um, through uh, physical spaces and help them engage with those physical spaces. So this video shows uh, an example um, of a pilot that we're doing with a UK supermarket called Marks and Spencers. Um, and you can see somebody adding pizza to their shopping list and it navigating them through the store. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of an example of, of kind of what we're, what we're building here at Den. Um, and you'll see at the bottom of that uh, screen or the video is that there's this map and the map is uh, all provided from data from our uh, customer portal, which is essentially a tool that allows uh, our customers to build uh, this outline, uh, like maps of their stores, essentially. Um, so yeah, that web portal, that customer portal, um, is where I spend a lot of my time and, and that's where I spend a lot of my energy. Um, and that kind of powers all of our mobile experiences. So we're on iOS at the moment and then hoping to also be on, on Android soon. Um, so the customer portal is all written in JavaScript, uh, or more specifically, all written in TypeScript. We're big TypeScript fans here. Uh, on the back end is Node uh, with Postgres, and on the front end, we're using React. And then probably most of interest with reference to this talk uh, is Mapbox uh, GL. Uh, and then across both front end and back end, we're using Turf, um, which is partially part of the reason why I'm getting so heavily involved with, with Turf at the moment. Um, and then also Jest, which is another important point for the context of this talk. So Jest is a very popular uh, JavaScript uh, testing framework, essentially. And, and most of the examples in this, uh, in this talk will be, be using Jest as the testing framework. Um, so why testing? Like, why is that like something that I thought was important to talk about? 
Uh, and like I was saying, like the past like year and a half, I, one thing that I've realized is that for us, like delivering correct, valid and exact data is absolutely critical for us providing like a good user experience. So if we have like corrupt geometries or we have geometries are that in the wrong place or whatever it might be, that directly impacts like the users of our, of our, of our application, right? So uh, whether that means that a shelf is like in the wrong place or it renders incorrectly or like the whole app just explodes because it can't render a geometry because it's self-intersecting or, or something like that. Um, these are all things that have like big knock-on consequences to the sort of end user experience. Um, and basically being able to write like rapid and good unit tests uh, allows us to ensure that those uh, that those geometries are correct and valid and are in the right place. Um, so yeah, let's talk a bit, like let's sort of build the, the bounding box of this talk, so to speak. So let's go over like what we will cover. Um, so in this uh, talk, we're gonna go over uh, unit testing at like a high level, what's unit testing, what are the benefits, uh, what are the cons, um, kind of what's the special concerns for uh, geos like geospatial data, like why, like what are the added complexities or what are the added uh, interesting features of like dealing with geospatial data? And then uh, gonna look at like, how do we smooth that over? So like, what are the, uh, yeah, what are the pitfalls of, of, of working with geospatial data, uh, specifically sort of in, in the JavaScript world? Um, and like, how can we smooth over this process or how can we make it better? Uh, so yeah, firstly, Unit, let's start with sort of unit testing in, in JavaScript. Um, so what is sort of unit testing? So I, th I think it's quite funny because I think, you know, uh, I've, I, I just read out this quote from Martin Fowler, which I think just hits the nail on the head, which is unit testing is often talked about in software development. And like most, soft most software development terminology, however, it's ill-defined. So what unit testing is, is probably means something slightly different to different people. Um, but I'm hoping that we can all come to a, like a rough consensus of like a, agreement about like what unit testing is just for like the, 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 the purpose of this talk. So I've taken this very like dry, uh, uh, academic quote about what unit testing is, which is unit testing is a method by which individual units of source code are tested to determine whether they are fit for use. So essentially we're talking about maybe it's a function, maybe it's a class, but it's sort of like an individual unit of code that we are testing like in isolation, hopefully with very limited sort of interactions outside of itself basically, or potentially none. Uh, so as a really simple example, just to bring everyone in the same level, let's think about this function sum, which just takes two numbers and adds them together, right? So get number one, number two, the two numbers, and we add them both. Uh, and a unit test for this might look something like this, right? So this is again using Jest, uh, the JavaScript testing framework. Um, so we uh, we build like a test suite called Sum, and then we have a unit test that says it adds two two numbers together, basically. So in this uh, example, we expect the sum of one and two should be three, right? And if 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 the um, you know the Earth still revolves around the sun, then hopefully that should be three, right? Um, if the computers are behaving. So that is like a little example of what a unit test is. And hopefully that just kind of brings everybody up onto the same page and gives a bit of an example of what Jest looks like um, for the for the future slides, for future reference. Um, so let's talk a bit about the geospatial domain or like why that's interesting or what, like, what are the added complexities of, of working with geospatial data when you're writing unit tests in, in JavaScript? Um, so geospatial has some really interesting challenges. So, I mean, the first one, which is maybe self-evident is that we deal a lot with geometry data. Um, and so this is just interesting because geometry data like is quite dry and sometimes quite hard to read when you're looking at it. If you've got like some plain text uh, geometry data, like, like ideal almost exclusively with like GeoJSON, right? Um, and essentially most of the time, like, uh, the bulk of that is just like the coordinates um, and coordinates when you look at them don't necessarily always like mean an awful lot like geometry generally lends itself to being visualized or as being seen like uh, you know on a map or in some sort of like um, you know visualized in some in some context basically 
Um, but unit tests are generally very they're text based, right? You run the test runner and it will just in your terminal and it will just uh, print out like a bunch of, you know, pass fail kind of thing, right? Um, so that's quite like an interesting problem in the sense of like um, the data like lends itself to this kind of geographical representation, but a lot of the unit testing, like in unit testing, it's, we are never, we're never looking at something uh, graphically. We're always just looking at it in uh, this, this kind of like plain text format, right? Um, and the other thing I think is quite interesting is like, understanding like the like if something is correct can be like quite a hard thing to understand or like wrap your head around and also quite a hard thing to uh, ensure you've got right so for example if you say like is this point on this line it's like that's quite a hard thing like uh, unless you are a mathematician uh, and you understand the the formula that has led for that that answer being true or false. It's quite a hard thing to necessarily reason about like why a, a point would be on a line. Um, and like, similarly, like if you have the, like if you're talking about a distance between two points, it's like, okay, well uh, this form, you know, like you might have uh, a Haversign formula that says the distance between these two points is, is X, right? But the like, there's another formula, the Vincenti formula, which is slightly more accurate, and that gives a slightly different result. And it's like, what is the correct distance between those two points? And it's like, well, you can only really say that the distance is correct in terms of this mathematical formula, not necessarily like it's an approximation of reality, right? So there's these interesting like additional layers of like complexity that I think only, that come through from like dealing with geospatial or geometric data. Um, so yeah, this, this kind of like on this, on this issue of like, how do we know like what we're writing is, is, is correct. Right. Um, and there's a, a few like different ways I think that, that, that this generally tends to happen. So, um, so there's some sort of like reference implementation. So maybe there might be like a paper, like an academic paper, which has been peer reviewed and you can trust that the, uh, formulas and that the, maybe there's some pseudo code in there or even some real code in there. Um, and we can trust that that's correct. And we can use that to, let's say we want to do a point in polygon algorithm. And we can trust that the algorithm that's in that paper is like, correct. And we, as long as we translate that correctly, um, they might even have some test cases in there that we can use, right? Um, the next thing is like kind of a, a step forward is like a reference library. So we can actually use a library that has the same functionality and then use it to test um, the results. So this might be a case if you want to do something like um, quick, you know, like you want to write a function and, and that's more efficient or faster than the, another function, but has the same output. And the last thing is this, uh, you know, empirical analysis, which is just a fancy way of just saying, uh, I have a bunch of test cases and I've, I've checked these bunch of test cases. So I've, I've, I've hopefully exhausted the problem space. And now I know that this thing is probably, this program is ultimately like correct as far as I can, I can realistically tell. Um, so yeah, like kind of, this, uh, the idea of this uh, reference implementation. So this is almost like verging on the side of like mathematical proofs or like proof by induction. Um, so this is like the proof for, I think like, I can't remember if this is the Vincenti or I think maybe the Haber sign formula, I can't remember. Um, but you know, like there's a, a formal mathematical proof that this, uh, this formula works and that like, if you translate this correctly into code, then it, it should, be, should be sort of correct. Um, and kind of like taking this idea a bit further, there's people who will go out, um, like, you know, smart people who will go out and kind of write out like reference implementations for, uh, you know, complex problems like the, uh, hey, I think, again, this thing, this is the Haversine, uh formula by a guy called Chris Vaness, who writes a lot of cool um, and very well thought out uh, geospatial, um, uh, in, like reference implementations for various geospatial uh, algorithms basically um and like here's an example of like something you, uh, of using like a reference library to te test if something's true so this i think is from uh cheap ruler which is a a like a fast way of measuring uh distances uh within like a, a small small space um and this by vladimir uh, matbox and he's using turf to check that the distance is the same 
um, or within a very small percentage of error, basically. Um, and that's basically just saying that, like, I know that this is, I'm using this as a, a reference point of correctness. Um, which, uh, yeah, that, so that's like this idea of using like a reference library to check that something's correct. Um, and the last one is just empirical analysis. So this is basically just writing out test cases to um, ensure that uh, like a, a program is correct. So here we have a, a, a function called polygon has coordinates. Uh, and I know for a fact that the past in coordinate is not in, I can, I can just manually check. I can say that that last coordinate there ends in 67 and none of the other coordinates end in 67. So I know that that coordinate isn't in there. And so I know that that, test is uh that at least that specific test case is is correct um and so we'd have to write an existed exhaustive list of you know um of other like uh, potential uh uh scenarios there to to try and prove that through like or prove that as best as possible from through this like empirical analysis uh approach um you know so the other thing you can do is 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 using uh just like like GUI, you know, like geojson.io or, or QGIS or whatever your tool of choice is to, to create test cases. So for example, say we're building like a point, in, we're writing a point in polygon algorithm, we can build a bunch of test cases for like this empirical analysis approach. Um, and, and that uh, works great. And it's very easy to just visually see like uh, when things are correct generally in, uh, in, that, in that, using that approach basically. Um, and the other thing that sometimes is great is when people write, if you've written a, a, an algorithm and somebody writes a really good bug, bug report, then you can turn this into a test case if they provide you the GOJ, like correct inputs and um, <clears throat> hopefully some some sample code to reproduce that the issue, basically. Next thing I just want to look at is uh, like common mistakes. So common mistakes that I see well, I have experienced a lot, um, kind of writing a lot of uh, unit tests in JavaScript over the last yeah, year and a half, um, especially in the sort of geospatial sort of domain. Um, so yeah, I will just, I've, I put out three things here, mutating inputs, uh, logic in the test just getting too long and not resetting things or not like correctly clearing objects that you're like passing into functions. So I'll go through each one of these. Um, so like mutating inputs, like this is quite an interesting thing. Maybe to some degree, this is like a JavaScript specific thing. Um, but if we update, if we change, uh, say for example, we have some GeoJSON and we change the coordinates here. We have this function called update coordinate uh, and it changes the, the coordinates of this polygon to some other like arbitrary uh, coordinates. Um, the problem that you had here is that you're actually like mutating the original polygon that you've you've passed in. So even though we've used the, what's called the spread operator here, which basically passes uh, all the properties of an object to a new object, uh, those properties, so the geometry property is still a reference to an object. So it's still referencing the original polygon geometry. Um, so, sorry, I've just realized there's a, uh, I say there's a there's an error here. I should have returned new polygon, but instead of polygon. Um, but in this in this case, if you have um, if you if you take the return from update coordinate, it would be uh, the geometry of that object would be a reference to the original polygon, which is probably not what was intended um, from this code. Like it was probably intended to basically like clone this and then return another object with. Um, some some new uh, coordinates basically, and so like you have to be really careful um, when you're updating uh, things in JavaScript that you're not up, you, that you are creating a copy and not updating a reference to another object or another array uh, because that is something that you can really shoot yourself in the foot with. Um, again, sim like one thing that I see happen quite a lot is like especially when you start, like, for example, we do a lot of stuff with Mapbox GL and like we mock out like Mapbox GL. And some of that code can get like super complicated really quickly because there's loads of mocks. Um, 
and you end up like mocking loads of uh, loads of methods, and you realize that that passes a new object that you need to mock that object as well, and it can become very complicated like very quickly. So um, I tend to what like so what thing I one thing that I try and do when when I'm writing code at Dent is I try and separate out a lot of just the like pure logical parts uh, away from the actual like map box, like event handler parts. Um, and then that way, like uh, a lot of the logic can actually just be handled by like a pure function. And then I don't necessarily have to try and mix like mocking like event handlers with also doing like ge geometrical, like ge geographic like operations basically. Uh, so yeah, like trying to reduce the complexity is, is definitely a good shout. Um, not resetting mocks. So this is just something like, I, this is an example of uh, like a piece of code where we apply some logic and we and it passes in like a mock function. Um, but then if you forget to reset the mock between those tests, then um, <clears throat> it will assume that that's been that will that second test will basically fail because that mock has already been called in the previous function. So this isn't necessarily something that's specific to geospatial code, but it's just something that I see, like that has just tripped me up like a few times when, again, especially with the Mapbox GL side of things, when you have mocks and they're not being reset properly. So Jess has this uh, function called reset all mocks, I think it's called, and you can just call that in like a before each, and that will make sure that the mocks are a reset. Um, another thing that's been really helpful is like uh, this things or like this thing called these things called like custom matches. So you can actually write a matcher to ensure that a uh, output is uh, like adheres to a certain. So as if if you if you said you know a, the built-in matcher in Jest might be expect to be greater than. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and here you can write a custom match like to be latitude. So this will ensure that it's between the boundaries of, you know, minus 90 and um, uh, and greater than and 90. So being able to write like custom matches is, is really helpful in terms of um, being able to uh, like ensure that r results um, are like are what we, th we think they are basically, which is, is cool. Uh, and you would just essentially use this like this. So let's say, I mean, here it's a bit contrived because we've just used a function called get random latitude, but this could be uh, a value that you expect to be a latitude. And we can just use now just use to be latitude and it will um, it will make sure that that's correct. Uh, and this is kind of like looking into the future or kind of some ideas that I've had. Like, so yeah, we've been right. Obviously, we've been writing a lot of unit tests and it's quite like I was saying, it can get quite exhaustive when you have to write all these um, um, unit tests for all these different cases. Um, and one thing I've been thinking about is like, it'd be cool if we could find a way to automate finding like these edge cases. So I've seen something similar to this happening with um, with GDAOs. They use OSS fuzz um, and fuzzing at like a high level is just a way of like firing loads of um, Ran, not necessarily random, but um, you know, like all kinds of different types of input data to basically check that the program handles that well and 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 behaves and doesn't basically explode. Um, and basically, I'm wondering if there's something that's similar that's possible with uh, within JavaScript uh, and also specifically in like the, the geospatial realm. I'm potentially using a library like something like FastCheck, which is what's called like a property-based testing. Um, framework um, and property based testing is kind of similar to fuzzing if you're familiar with fuzzing where it's basically like you define the parameters um, yeah you define like uh, uh, a specification and you make sure that that like range of data uh, adheres to that specification so it will generate like random or like a range of data points and it will make sure that it passes all of those data points so it can basically like generate a, like a range of test cases mm -hmm. Um, so if you could basically generate um, like random polygons and just make sure that it like doesn't explode uh, or like that your programs don't explode, that would be super cool. So yeah, um, lastly, 
you know, uh, there's this Dijkstra quote that says, program testing can show can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never that abs never to show that absence. It's basically like unit testing isn't a, uh, you know, silver bullet, it won't solve all your problems, but um, it's a good way of, of catching the low hanging fruit and ensuring that your, your, your code hopefully does what you, you think it does uh, at, at that, like at that low unit level, at least. So yeah, thanks a lot. James, thank you so much for your presentation and for sharing your experience. Uh, we only have a few minutes, uh, but we have questions for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, the first one uh, is expected. How do you test things like visual representations? So it's it's not yeah. testing a function. You have to know how it, this is rendering. And even yeah. if you have different displays, this can be rendered differently. Yeah, it's a really, it's something I've also like thought about quite extensively. So, I mean, probably the right answer is to write, is to use some sort of like end-to-end -end testing framework. Um, I've, I've, I've always struggled to basically do this with uh, maps, specifically anything like WebGL based, because basically the, when you write these end-to-end -end tests, like if you use like Cypress or a library similar, it will generally run fine on your machine, on your laptop or your desktop machine. But most CI providers don't have graphics cards. So generally the cheat, like whenever it, it, like a lot of them can't, like can't render stuff. Uh, like they, they basically can't do, do WebGL stuff on, on uh, like in CI. Is has been that's every time I try to do it, it that's been my problem. Um, so I'm not sure. Like if you're just doing it locally, I'm sure you could use something like Cypress to, like an end-to-end -end testing framework to basically say, and I click here and then I click here and this looks how I expect it to look basically. Um, but yeah, I've always struggled because, like, the uh, it, I think like the CI just basically doesn't support WebGL is, has been my issue basically. Okay. We have another question related to the Nest uh, JS. Do you have oh, an right. experience that you want to share, uh, especially related to this geospatial component? Nest JS. Uh, I mean, there's nothing specific about Nest JS that lends itself to like doing geospatial stuff. What I will say is that like Nest JS is like a really great, it gives you like a really, it's like what's called like an, uh, takes like that MVC approach, that model view controller approach. So there's, it's got this really strong separation of concerns. So, uh, it really allows you to isolate like your logic from like the kind of presentation part, um, which I think is super cool. So basically like in some ways, I guess that's, that's quite cool because it means that that kind of ge all the complex geospatial logic you can wrap up in a service and it will never be exposed to your actual like how you choose to like surface your like api endpoints or any of that kind of stuff so it, it isolates that stuff very well good we are on time but i think we still have time for two or three questions another okay. one is it's more more <laughs> fundamental question relating to development methodology. Can you yeah. share what kind of methodology do you write your tests after writing the code? Do you write, when do you write the tests? It's a really great question. And I think who, depending on who you ask, you will always get like a different answer. Um, you know, there's some real die hard, strict uh, test driven development people out there. Um, I probably don't fall into that camp. Um, because a lot of what I end up working on is quite exploratory. And I find that like test driven development doesn't necessarily, like, I think test driven development, like really lends itself to when you have like a really clear spec of like what you want to build. Like if you know you're building like a calculator or like, I don't know, something else, you know, with a very clear set of behaviors, uh, I think it lends itself really well. But if you're doing something where you're like, I don't necessarily know how this should behave yet. Um, I find that like test driven development doesn't really lend itself to 
it that way. I might just be doing it wrong. Um, you know, like there's a lot of people that absolutely swear by it. And I wouldn't say like, don't do test driven development. Um, I just say like, it depends on your team and it depends on your probably to some degree, like your approach to how you think about problems and all this kind of stuff. So um, I tend, so I guess, yeah, the question was, what would I do? I tend to, I tend to try and figure out what I'm doing first and then write the tests. Uh, so I tend to write them, I guess, afterwards most time, or like I end up refactoring stuff a lot and then writing tests, like taking a piece of code, like writing some tests and then like isolating bits of code and then writing tests around the isolated bits of code and, and that kind of stuff, like basically breaking stuff down a lot and then writing tests around the, the, the code that I've broken out. Um, I hope that kind of answers that question. Yes, just, just one more and we end. It's time for you to, to, to rest, but one related with the synchronous events and how can you test things that can happen in parallel and... Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that we like, like asynchronous testing is just a real headache at the moment. Like even in jest, like asynchronous testing is really painful. Um, uh, there's like a known issue in jest with like, uh, where like, if you're like awaiting promises, like you have to basically flush out the promise queue for like, if in, in JavaScript, you have to flush out the promise queue to like, then expect what you w want to happen. If that makes sense. Basically it's like, it's, it's a real headache. Um, at least from my experience, I think there's, I think a lot of people know that it's a headache. Um, <laughs> that I don't I don't know if it's like a good answer to that question. I think it's just a problem that like everybody faces at some point is like yes, testing yes. is anything to do with timers or promises or any of that kind of stuff tends to just cause problems at some point for some people. Yes, but it's also an advantage of JavaScript. <laughs> the, the synchronicity yeah. of, of things. So I, but I it's also the, I think the problem with JavaScript is there's you if somebody if somebody shows you a function and call, you have no way of knowing if it's synchronous or asynchronous up front. Like if it, you don't know if it contains, if it's a synchronous or asynchronous function. So it, like, that's just like one of the downsides, I guess, is that it, sometimes it's very easy to get confused about like what's, what's going on and what's running asynchronously and what's running synchronously and all this kind of stuff. Okay, James, thank you very much. And thank you for taking this time to answer the questions. See you in the gala dinner. So, and it's, it's my opportunity to invite all for the gala dinner next to these presentations. So the, the Portuguese uh, session ends here. Thank you for watching us and I will close the, the broadcast. See you in the gala dinner. <laughs>